I'm Anne of All Trades, and I love doing things the way they used to be done. I love teaching people disappearing life skills and how to grow their community. And one of the things I really love is restoring old tools and making them useful again, because then every time you use them, you're holding a piece of history and making more history yourself. The first thing that we need to do to get this going is to undo some of the creative fixes that have been done to make this ax head stay where it's supposed to stay. A side note, actually, because I love using old tools so much, this is another hewing hatchet that I happen to have, just the head. Um, this was my grandfather's. So while we're fixing up this one, we're gonna fix up this one too. And this is extra special because I happen to be ambidextrous. I'm ambidextrous. I can use both hands um, to do things. And so I wanted a left-handed and a right-handed hewing hatchet for um, breaking down spoon stock. So this is gonna work out great for that. So we'll start with a homemade tool. This is just a little punch to get the, hopefully, get that wood out. So someone's grandpa sometime did a really nifty fix on their ax to rehandle it and they put these two metal wedges in there which uh, really don't want to come out but we got that little guy there. Who would have thought? Such a tiny little piece of metal. After we've got all of the wood removed, we are going to use hot soapy water, um, dish soap, and an abrasive pad are a great way to do this. And we're gonna try to get as much of the surface rust and just like dirt and grime off of these as possible. The more you can get down into some of this pitting with the washing, the better off you'll be when it comes to soaking it in citric acid, which is the next step, because you just get some of those crusties off to start. All right, we've got some warm water. The warm water will help to break up the rust. Hot, 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 hot. Ooh, that is real warm. And then we're gonna put some citric acid in. The warm water will help it dissolve. So I just wanna give this a quick stir and make sure that all that citric acid dissolves. And then pretty quickly, we should start to see little bubbles coming up off of the tools. And that's, you know, the citric acid basically eating away the rust. While we're waiting for the citric acid to do its magic, let's go ahead and make some handles for these axes. So I use a little pattern. Um, this. <laughs> is a very arbitrary pattern, but I like to be able to lay it out on the piece of wood so that I can make sure that we do have as much continuous grain running along the handle as possible. This one's gonna be really easy because it's literally just so straight. Um, but if I can take advantage of any little striations or whatever with the, the slight curvature of the handle, I want to. It curves out a little bit right here, so I'm gonna actually put that piece right there, and that is gonna help us to take advantage of all that goodness. If you have a bandsaw, you can also use that. So let's go cut this out. We're going to use our finger as a reference here and we're gonna project the marker out about a quarter of an inch, maybe a little bit more. And we're going to give ourselves some rough reference guides uh, for how we should actually make this thing uh, rounded out and comfortable to use. We'll mark it on all the sides so we know where we need to remove some material. Now we're going to start really truing it up. And to do that, we can use a knife easily. 
My business partner, Josh Nava, and I teach a lot of online carving classes. So if you want to learn the basics of, of carving safely, you can do that by going to our website, theschoolofalltrades.com, and signing up for the basics of hand carving online classes. And we'll teach you how to use a $25 knife to use free reclaimed materials to make beautiful hand carved objects. All right, let's take a little gander at what's happening in here. Uh, holy shamoli, I think we done. So this has uh, obviously been in citric acid, so we want to make sure that we stop the uh, chemical reaction that is happening from continuing to happen. So as soon as I get all this kind of wiped off here, I want to rinse it off really, really well. Now I'm gonna dry it off very well. And now I'm gonna just put some jojoba oil on them, the microfiber cloth, and that will keep them from flash rusting. That is so cool. You can see the, uh, the stamp now a lot better. When we've got the ax heads out of their chemical baths, we've got that acid neutralized, we've got these all wiped off, we can go ahead and hang our handles, but it's actually way easier to sharpen the axes without the handle on it. So we're gonna do that first. I would actually say that this kind of ax is way easier to sharpen than this kind of ax because we are only dealing with one angle as we're sharpening. Whereas with this one, we've got two angles that meet at the tip. This one is just a flat back and a bevel that meets it. So, you know, in older axes, often there's pitting and stuff near the edge, and um, either you have to grind it back behind it, or you have to uh, flatten it down below the pitting. So in this case, uh, I think we're gonna actually be okay if we just remove a little bit of this material here, and then we can do the rest by flattening. And we're going to remove the bulk of that initial material with a process I'm gonna call grinding, even though we're using sandpaper. Um, we're gonna be removing a lot of material in a hurry. So this is the grinding process, then we'll go through the sharpening and then the honing process. And really with all of those, it just means that you're starting with big rocks or big abrasives and you're moving to smaller and smaller abrasives. And I wanna just remove material by sliding it back and forth on this surface. Our mantra when, when we're restoring anything or when we're first learning how to sharpen is to stop and check our progress constantly. You always want to check and make sure you didn't make a mistake before you've made a mistake that's too big to come back from. So now is the fun part, flattening the back. And we have a secret weapon when it comes to this part, a Sharpie. And this is going to help us to check our progress. So remember I said when you're learning how to sharpen, uh, you want to check your progress often so you can stop yourself from making big long-term mistakes. Now, why am I not covering this whole back with Sharpie? Really, all we care about ultimately is that leading edge. And so it's great if we can flatten other places because eventually over many years we can you know, continue to sharpen it and we'll move back over this area. But all we care about for right now is this leading edge here. So I'm gonna put Sharpie on it to let me know um, kind of how I'm doing. And there's a gentle balance here between where I know that it's like very flat and uh, where there's, you know, where I'm just needlessly removing tons and tons of material from this entire back. So I'm gonna find a place where it can kind of register comfortably and I can slide it back and forth. Now, there is something very, very important that I wanna talk about really quick. If we are going to flatten the back and if what we need for a very sharp edge is to have the back completely flat and then to have the bevel meet the edge for that zero radius intersection across the entire edge, then we have to start with something that we know is flat to use to flatten the back of the blade. So I'm using a glass plate right now. You can get these on Amazon. I have put a link for this in the bottom of the video. Um, and then I'm using just some abrasive. I love getting these um, cutoffs of machine shop um, 
wet dry sandpaper because you can get a whole pack of cutoffs that happen to be the perfect size. I'll also put a link for those below. Um, you can get these for like $11. And so I wanted to show you all um, a, a more affordable sharpening setup. And this is where that Sharpie comes in the handiest of all the handies because this part is where we get a little bit more tricky. The grinding is definitely the thing that takes the longest. And I mean, I would be remiss to not say something about having an ax to grind in this situation. To refine that edge further, we are going to make ourselves some sharpening slips. And again, this is just another low cost option um, to save yourself having to buy a whole bunch of stones and other things. We're gonna fold it around. So now we're just going to move up the grips. We're going to put what's called a tiny back bevel on this and that is going to help us to alleviate some of the issues that we might have with pitting and other things at the end. It's also going to save us a whole lot of time while we are flattening the back of this axe blade here because we don't actually have to flatten the entire back. Once we've gotten it reasonably flat, we can raise it up ever so slightly by using a little feeler gauge uh, and we'll save ourselves a whole lot of time and effort. So here is that burr, that wire edge. It just is starting to break off. But that is a further confirmation that we've got what we need as far as sharpness goes. And this is a piece of leather soaked in oil and then charged with this waxy abrasive compound. Um, and what a strop does is it gives you a little bit of an insurance policy. I mean, A, we're taking we are still a braiding material, but because that leather is a little bit flexible, it does allow us to make sh to kind of get rid of any little errors uh, that we may have introduced. People seem to like to know that their blade is sharp by using it to shave, and as you can see, make a wish. All right, we have a very, very sharp ax at this point, so now, we are going to tape up this edge and keep ourselves from, you know, cutting off a finger or something in the hanging process. Now we're ready to hang the axe head on the handle. And this is going to be a left-handed axe, so I want to make sure that I uh, orient the head in the right way. This is my grandfather's axe, so I want to make sure to keep it left-handed just like he was. And then I'll have a handy dandy left-handed and right-handed version after these two restorations are done. Um, but as I'm fitting this, I want to just basically use my fingers as uh, guides here. I'm going to project out from these lines that I had already marked. I now have my middle finger there and my middle finger is going to ride on the wood so I can mark a nice straight line there. This is going to help me to make sure that I'm removing material evenly and that that axe head ends up getting hung straight. Attach my lines in that teardrop pattern that matches that what's on the axe head there. And this is going to give me basically a rough idea of what, what material I want to remove so that I can hang the hatchet pro or the head properly. So now I can just use my carving knife to remove that material. carving this little mantra we do corner corner middle corner corner middle we're always removing the corners because it's always easier to cut a corner than to cut the middle uh do a little test make sure oh yes 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 see this is what we want we want to get close enough from the start that we don't spend 10 years kind of chasing our tails back and forth so now i'm looking down inside it and i can see uh, where the light's coming through and that's all good stuff because that lets me know where the high points are as does um, starting to seat it and letting the axe where the axe is rubbing 
um, also tell me where those high spots are. So just go behind that and remove some material. One really important thing to mention is that once you've got it fitting to a certain point, you want to make sure not to remove any more material from behind that point because we don't want to get it too loose up there near the tip of the head. We would rather it be a little bit looser down here so that we can wedge it from the top. But we just want to keep siding down here. All right, we just need to make sure our wedge is going to fit down in there. So, now did you hear that? Probably not because it was a lot of banging, a lot of noise, but we are, we're seated now. Oh, you know what this is missing though? I, ha I know. I've been doing a ton of spoon carving since I moved to Nashville. First of all, because wood that is amazing to carve just grows on trees around here. But also because my business partner, Josh Nava and I have been teaching all kinds of Zoom classes um, about the spoon carving process online. You can find those on my Squarespace website. Squarespace has been a fantastic platform for someone who is not super tech savvy like me to create a place where I can share my thoughts on my blog online, where I can sell my merchandise and with a new scheduling app that they offer as well as email communication with my email list, I'm able to schedule our Zoom classes and then teach them online. If you wanna start a website of your own, it could not be easier for you to get the information that you wanna put out there in the world into a beautiful artist design template using Squarespace. If you'd like to try it out, go to squarespace.com and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash Trades for a 10% discount. 100 plus years old, back in action. A tale of two axes, both fully restored and ready to cut. And now I get to basically have just made an entire video to show off the fact that I'm ambidextrous. 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 And dextrous. Anyway. Still heavy. Now, this one. The most important thing is that it chaps and that it looks good. Ta-da! If you're interested in spoon carving, check out this playlist and I will see you in the next video. Cheers!